Hey guys, let's talk about mitt work real quick. So mitt work, there's really mainly maybe three types of mitt work. There's the flashy mitt work that you do for clout, but it, there's also some benefits to it. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Then you have the technical mitt work that you actually do to become specifically, like very narrowly focused, a better boxer. And then there is conditioning mitt work. All right. Now, don't be wrong. These things can all kind of run over each other because you could be doing very technical mitt work that is kind of flashy and interesting to see uh, that also builds conditioning. And there's a whole lot of crossover there. But those are just kind of three chunks that at least is the way I look at it. Now, let's talk about first about flashy mitt work. All right. A lot of boxing coaches like to trash on flash, flashy mitt work. Right. Uh, a lot of times, honestly, I feel like it's because they they can't do it. Don't get me wrong. Some of them can do it. But I know at least some coaches, just like with wrapping hands, they're not so good at wrapping hands. They just never took the time to do it. They don't really have that growth mindset. So yeah, they are really good at coaching or really good at certain aspects of coaching, but they don't really have the full picture. So they're a little bit slow on the mitts or whatnot. They're, they, more, they come a bit more from that fighter background. I've worked with a lot of guys that I've tried to help them transition from being a fighter to a coach. And they're like stuck in this, like I'm a fighter mode. So I know how to fight. And I know how to talk about fighting, but mitt work, that's something else. So anyway, that's my thoughts on that. Flashy mitt work does have some limited usage. The benefits though is cognitively, you're memorizing sequences. Also, you're doing sequences that you wouldn't normally do in a fight, which is why people say don't do it or why it's garbage. But I can tell you from personal experience, I've had boxers, one boxer comes to mind specifically that he's now actually an undefeated pro fighter. We were doing specific mitt work stuff. It was like left, a lot of left work, lead hand work, and mixing like the five and the three and like all these different crazy sequences like that. and it actually translated to his next fight that he won. And he utilized these moves that he'd never done before, and we were doing it when? In flashy mitt work. It was just flashy mitt work, you know, building up some condition, having some fun, looking flashy with it, doing sequences he wasn't used to, and I definitely see a benefit to it. Being someone that was trained by an old school boxing coach, my father, he was very much just, almost that martial arts style of training, of like you're gonna do these one, two, three moves, and you're gonna do them over and over again until you can't get them wrong. And, there's an absolute benefit to that, but the downside to that is over enough time, an athlete, a boxer, a fighter does become burned out. It does happen. And so it's good to keep things fresh. It's good to change things up. And again, at the very end of the day, if flashing mirror work has any benefit, it's maybe getting the athlete to be a little faster and also to just do things and mix up patterns and do patterns that they don't normally do they're, that they're not used to. Because we all see it, right? These boxers that will do the same darn, like, couple punch sequences all the time and it can become pretty easy to beat and to anticipate what they're going to do, all right? So then you have obviously the fighter mitt work, the technical mitt work, and that's what you're going to see a video on in just a second. Uh, some just simple, a small sample of the myriad of different concepts we have for actual, you know, drill, fighter style mitt work, working on techniques, tactics, and concepts. And obviously, big benefit to it. Uh, it's something that you don't see, honestly, I think enough. You tend to see either the flashy mitt work or the conditioning mitt work, which I'll get to in a second on the conditioning mitt work. But you don't really see that thoughtful technical mitt work where it's a, it's a great teaching tool. And that's something that you know my father exposed to me, Doc Kepner, is that to use mitts as one of the greatest tools for teaching, right? Because you, you could actually do things with the mitts and... Uh, mix of different things that you couldn't do in a sparring session or even in a drill situation, and especially not on a bag. Because obviously what's great about the mitts is you can move with the mitts. You can make someone have to step in with a double, triple jab, things like that, or step off to the side, and uh, so many variables. And uh, that's what makes it such a great benefit and really underutilized. Again, you tend to see the flashy mitt work, you tend to see the conditioning mitt work, you tend to not see so much the thoughtful mitt work where it's actually teaching, all right? And that's a big distinction. My father's mentor, Chuck Bodak, who worked with over 50 world champions, including he was the Olympic coach for Muhammad Ali. If you'd call him a trainer, he'd be mad at you, be pissed. <clears throat> he said, I'm a teacher, all right? And that's what I think all of us coaches should strive to do, to be a coach. What is a coach? A coach is not just a trainer. Like Chuck would say, a trainer is someone who works with wild animals, right? <laughs> you train the animal, right? You, you hit it when it does it, the wrong thing and you give it a treat when it does the right thing. We're, we're teachers. The conditioning mitt work, big benefit to that as well because you're having someone externally push you, all right? Think about that. It's not just the bag and an ammon object. It's actually somebody forcing you, in a sense, to throw at that exact time. Again, kind of the, going back to the flashy thing, 
doing something you're not comfortable with, which is if you're working with a coach, they're going to ask you to throw right at that time, and you got to go right at that time. And so it's great for, I know when I was boxing in Mexico, my father and I got to the point where we were doing like 10 or 12, I think even sometimes 12 rounds, all right? But let me be conservative, let me say eight rounds. A hard mitt work, and where it's three minute rounds, <clears throat> 30 second break, and everything is like starting with a double jab, everything's multiple punch combination, and everything is on his call, on my coach's call. So he's calling for me to shoot, bam, 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 classic, do it and just run through it, run through it, run through it and doing that nonstop. And if you're not punching, you got to be moving and he's forcing you to move. And if you're not doing any of those, he's throwing some shots at you. So you got to block and catch those shots. And that, I tell you, prepares you like no other. A professional fighter that I worked with for quite a few years, he went from fighting a fight. He had, they had two fights really close. It was like four weeks apart or three weeks apart. And so during that time, you have the ring time. And again, he had, you know, multiple professional fights. So he had enough time sparring and things like that, but he had just come off of a fight. So it's like, you don't necessarily want to put in more sparring, you know, depending. So, but a great way to replace sparring for that moment is to do that type of mitt work. And let me tell you, we got to the point of doing a ton and ton, a ton of rounds. And that did properly prepare him to actually have one of his best performances against a former world champion. So let's jump into this video here. So the first technique you'll see here is that we are using the mitt to shoot a jab and then slip with the right hand as we uh, slip a right hand, all right? So we put out the jab and then oftentimes someone might throw a right hand after we do a jab, you're slipping. Or you can imagine with a southpaw too, a southpaw might shoot their jab right after your jab and you can counter with that right hand. So you put out that jab, you slip their shot, their straight right hand, whatever it is, whether it's a jab from a southpaw or a two from an orthodox, and you get your head offline and pop, you pop them, it's a beautiful punch. Anyone that's ever sparred, anybody that's had this, <laughs> that has it done to you, it sucks, makes you not wanna throw, and <clears throat> it's a beautiful tool to utilize. Uh, and then the next one is incorporating it with a step back. So if anything, you're almost kind of baiting them to lean in with the right hand, which obviously can help maximize your power. So you're doing the jab, doing a step back, and then slipping and baiting them uh, in with that right hand punch. Then here we are with the other drill. We're mixing in the right cross. So we're crossing over with the right hand over the jab. It's important to have many ways to beat a jab. Uh, you want to have many, many answers because if you only have one answer to beat a jab or one answer to beat a punch, you're going to run out of answers at some point because then they will come up with an answer for that answer. My typical rule of thumb is you want about five answers. Yeah, there's more, but you want about five in your toolkit that you can pull out. Again, not willy-nilly and not just like, oh, I did one, it worked. Let me do number two, that works. Oh, number, th no. Nah. You, you find the one or two that works, you keep on doing them until they find answers for them and then you have to change it. All right, so very important move, the right cross. Something that's funny, everyone calls a right hand, a straight right hand from an orthodox, a right cross. It's not, it's in my opinion, not technically actually correct. A right cross is crossing over your opponent's punch like you're seeing here. And this is how you can use mitt work to do the exact move and to get the exact feel for what that looks like. It's phenomenal stuff. And then we here, have here doing some, some defensive work, very important. Uh, again, like I talked about earlier, the benefit of doing fighter type mitt work, having someone working their hand defense, you can mix up footwork here, head movement, etc. And then also mixing that jab and the catch, at, jab and catch at the end. So beautiful. And then we also got doing a little bit of speed work here. So kind of working on that fluidity, working on getting him snapping his feet a little bit with his punches and to kind of get that loose speed. Because with this fighter here, that's something that he definitely needs to work on. So that is something actually incorporating uh, essentially some almost like some flashy mitt work into the regular fighter, fighter mitt work because of the benefit, all right? You're forcing them to go faster than they're comfortable with and that will help develop their speed and their timing to a large extent. Here you have countering the right hand. Very simple basic move, it's important to know how to beat a right hand, right? Think about it, we're working on how to beat a jab and we're working on how to beat a right hand. The one and the two, there's a reason why, like I was telling someone earlier, the one and the two are called the one and the two because they're the most common punches to throw because also they will typically be the most successful but you gotta know how to beat them, gotta have answers for them. So here, you see this boxer blocking the right hand and countering with their right hand on a non-traditional mitt on the, uh, with, the, with the mitts just because that allows them to get it off quicker but to get the feel of actually blocking that right arm coming at them, blocking it appropriately and shooting for just about the exact area. That's one thing real quick on a side note, little pet peeve is making sure the mitts stay kind of in tight. 
very easy to kind of be out here with the mitts, but they're not fighting the Michelin Man, this tire, this big wide area, right? So you want to keep it compact and hopefully as realistic as possible. About wraps it up, guys. So implement these aspects into your training. Try out some of these routines. See how it goes for you. And watch out for the next video. Also, if you feel like anyone could benefit from this video, make sure you share it with them. Make sure you comment below if you have any questions, thoughts, or uh, you know, just any things that you want more information about or any other concepts that you'd like for me to touch on. And make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And we'll see you on the next video.